Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We will be getting started in about a minute. I recommend grabbing something to write with, something to write on if you don't have that handy. As we listen to Denise uh, share some knowledge. So getting started promptly at noon Central Standard Time. And again, for those of you who are just joining, thank you so much. I recommend grabbing something to write with and something to write on. We will be getting started here in under a minute. Okay, I am showing noon on the dot. So we will go ahead and kick things off. Thank you all again uh, so much for taking time out of your day to join us here at this event. Um, and welcome to the American Family Insurance Dream Bank where we believe in the transformative power of dreams. My name is Andy Frisky. I am a senior dream curator with Dream Bank, and I'm so thrilled to have you with us today. As we get started, we always like to pull the audience and learn where you're joining us from and encourage you to do so and share in the chat if you are comfortable with. Um, but for those of you who aren't familiar with Dream Bank, would love to take a few moments and uh, explain to you kind of who we are and why we exist. So here at American Family Insurance, we believe that communities are stronger and futures are brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. And that's why Dream Bank was created. It's an inspirational community destination and digital experience that is dedicated to dreamers everywhere. Our offerings are designed um, to help you celebrate the dream journey, overcome obstacles and stay motivated. And I'll be including a few more links to give you some further context about Dream Bank, some other upcoming events we have, and where to find the recordings for our previous events. But I'm really excited to introduce our featured speaker today, Denise Thomas. Uh, and let me go ahead and kick that off. So Denise is the president and owner of the Effective Communication Coach LLC, which is a consultancy focused on transforming emerging and existing professionals into extraordinary leaders by mastering the art of effective communication. So with 19 years of experience with Fortune 500 companies, Denise has honed the ability to deliver and receive messages across language, cultural, and communication style barriers. She's been recognized for excellence in leadership from companies such as Toyota Manufacturing Indiana, PepsiCo, General Electric, and Miller Coors. Denise continues her focus on empowering people by traveling and teaching effective communication to professionals worldwide, including Egypt, China, and Israel. Without further ado, though, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Denise. Denise, take it away. Thank you so much, Andy. Happy Tuesday, everyone. I get my days mixed up, but thank you so much for making the time to be here this morning. I am absolutely thrilled to be with each of you. And today we're going to talk about cross-generational effective communication. Now, today's session is designed to be very engaging and interactive because I know for many of us, especially as adults, we learn much better when we're gaining things that we can apply through the, the practice versus just listening to me speak for the next 45 minutes or so. So with that, I'm going to ask that for the spirit of inclusivity, I know that many of us, we have our video on, uh, excuse me, video muted, uh, but just know that as a speaker, when all I see is black boxes with names, it's as if I'm in a room that's pitch black. So I'm gonna ask that if you could be so kind, if you could unmute your video so that I could see your beautiful and handsome faces. Look at that. The beauty is already kicking in. I love it. So let's go ahead and get started because again, we have a lot to cover and today's session will go by fast. So we're gonna talk about cross-generational communication and we're gonna understand further what that means. Like what is the makeup of generations, what each generation brings to the table. And even more importantly, how we can continue to collaborate with each other across different generations and looking at more from a possibility standpoint versus a problem standpoint. Because I know for many of us, depending on which generation that most resonates with us, quite frankly, we get tired of hearing about what we don't do well because of how we identify from a generation standpoint. And this is really about how we're going to bridge those gaps. And again, focus more on the possibilities of working with different generations more so than the problems. And I see folks are sending in 
uh, their home location through the chat box. Continue to do that. If you have any questions or just want to share thoughts or perspectives, please, please, please do not hesitate to unmute your audio, your video, as well as send in your thoughts through the chat box. We want to make sure that this is engaging for everyone. So let's get started. Now, I want to remind each of us that generational differences or how each of us show up, whether it's personal or professional, has everything to do with how and why we were conditioned. And from that conditioning, which starts from the age of birth to seven years old, we then test what we were conditioned. Now, let me just ask you, and again, feel free to use the chat or unmute your audio. Who, who conditions us? Who conditioned us when we, were, when we were in our formative years between zero and seven? Who conditioned us? Family, yes. Parents, parents, who else? How do we receive our conditioning? Church, absolutely. Television, I'm a product of Sesame Street. Yes, Kathy and I said at the same time, Sesame Street, school, teachers, our friends. There were so many different sources of conditioning. And from that, we begin to test what we were conditioned to do, whether it's in terms of how we act, what we think, et cetera. And then when we started to enter junior high school, or some also know it as middle school, up and through college, we decided who we were from a socialization standpoint. Now, as human beings, we know that it's human nature for us to naturally gravitate towards what? What type of people do humans naturally gravitate towards? What type of people? What type of people do we naturally just graduate? Exactly. Like-minded people who remind us of us. If you don't believe me, go back to your high school cafeteria. And so what oftentimes that we will have to remind ourselves, especially as adults, because no one can change us but us. I'm the only person that can change me. I could be influenced. I can be persuaded. There can be recommendations, but at the end of the day, who's going to change me is me. And so part of working in a cross-generational environment or even living in a cross-generational environment has everything to do with embracing, not just understanding, but embracing that people are different based on generation because generations that come from the baby boomer or the Gen X era are gonna be different from millennials and Gen Zers. Are y'all with me? So keep in mind that there is power in understanding and embracing why and how people show up. Now, we're gonna play a little game called Did You Know? And so feel free to send in your guesses in the chat box or just unmute your audio. What percent of the U.S. workforce will retire over the next five years? What percent of the U.S. workforce will retire? Kathy shares 30, 30 percent. Alan says 45 percent. Latanya shares 60. Angie shares 15. So the percent of the U.S. workforce that retire that will retire over the next five years is 40%. It's out of every 10 US workers, four of those individuals are gonna retire. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Retirement age, stress. Yes, Jamie, Kathy shares baby boomers. Now, you would think that that number potentially could be a little bit higher, but there's also the reality that due to inflation, due to the obsolete of pension, 
that many people are realizing that they have to work longer. So think about that. Think about how the workplace will have people working longer. So you're going to have potentially opportunities to work with both Gen Zers, millennials, as well as Gen Xers and even baby boomers. Next question, as of 2020, so two and a half years ago, nearly what percentage of the American workforce are under the age of 32? As of 2020, what percentage of the American workforce are under the age of 32? What percentage do you think? 40, Jamie says 40, Alan says 15. Let me get some other guesses, 20, thanks Joe. 50, all right, so the number of American workers under the age of 32 as of 2020 is nearly 50%. So that means out of every, oops, excuse me, out of every two people, just two people, in the workplace, one of those two will be under the age of 32. Now you combine that with the first question. What does that mean? That means that we are truly going to have to embrace our generational differences and not look at them more so as problems, but really focusing on what can we leverage? What does each of these generations bring that we can leverage to not only meet, but exceed our business growth objectives? All right, next question. 56% of college students across the world, not just the US, but worldwide, said they would not accept the job that banned blank. What is that? What is that blank? 56% of college students around the globe said, if you ban this, I'm not working there. What do you think that is? Somebody says cell phones. Vacation time, PTO, remote work. These are all actually absolutely correct. The 56% said that they would not accept a job that banned social media. Why do you think that is? Why do you think that is? Anyone? Exactly. Harmony shares freedom of expression. Here's the reality. As someone who is 46, I'm 46 years old, so I identify textbook definition as a Gen Xer. Part of my socialization was picking up the phone, going out to parties. However, my children who are 24 and 27, so both millennials and Gen Zers, their primary way of socializing was social media. And it's very easy for us to get into the us versus them. And we have to remind ourselves when engaging and interacting and working with different generations, what was the primary way that they were conditioned to socialize with their peers? And in this case, for current existing college students, traditional, Social media is not an option. It is the way that I communicate or as Harmony had shared, it's a freedom of expression. Now, our final question in the did you know is 65% of millennials say that losing their blank or their blank would have a greater negative impact on their day-to-day -day routine than losing their car. What are those two things? Losing their blank and blank. Internet, cell phone, cell phone, internet. What other guesses? Well, you're right. Phone or computer. And to Sandy and Harmony's point, you best believe that I have some Wi-Fi somewhere <laughs> because I need to make sure that I can connect. Harmony shares as a millennial, those are things I definitely cannot live without. I'm with you. Now, for, for me growing up, what do you think for a Gen Xer? What are the two things? 
And actually one of them is listed in this question. What are the two things that I had to have in order to be social? As a younger person, exactly. Alan said vehicle. You better believe it. When I was growing up, you know, I turned 16 in 1992. Okay, don't say it. I know some of y'all were saying, man, I wasn't even thought of in 92. So I've turned 16 in 1992. And let me tell you, I was the first person at the DMV, the Department of Motor Vehicles, to get my license. The DMV opened up at eight. I was there at 630. Because I had to get my driver's license in order to be social. And she says, me too. I had to have my driver's license and I had to have a phone, landline. And let me tell y'all this, this is so funny. You know, you can't even imagine the stress that was related to long distance phone calls. Long distance phone calls. I ran up my cell phone bill one time, my parents' cell, or excuse me, cell phone bill. I ran up my parents' phone bill to like $700 back in like 93, 94. I just paid it off last week. No, I'm kidding. But these are the things that we have to consider as part of working with different generations is how we were conditioned. It's not for me to say, hey, LaTanya, you've been on the internet too much. Because based on how I was introduced to the internet, it was a leisure extracurricular activity where for some generations, i.e. millennials, i.e. Gen Zers, that was how, and that is how we communicate. It's very important to understand that how we prefer or how we need to communicate in terms of mechanisms and tools and resources is not the same for everybody. And we cannot expect ourselves from everyone else. Alan shares, I remember needing to talk at certain times on the cell phone because those minutes were free on the family plan. I remember that too. But remember this, take this if you don't take anything else away, is that different generations have experienced different ways of communicating. And it doesn't make it wrong or right if it's different from yours, it's the understanding and the awareness. Does that make sense? It's the understanding and the awareness. Any thoughts or questions on this slide? Did you know? Okay. Now we're gonna start with the baby boomers and we're gonna go through what each of these generations, the makeup of each of these generations. Now with baby boomers, the years, the birth years are between 1946 and 1964. The ages range between 56 and 74. This particular generation for every four white people in the workplace, one was of color, so about 25%. That was the norm, to work with just 25% of people that were people of color. The primary way of communicating was call me, pick up the phone. Now, what did, what did this particular generation experience? What did this generation experience in terms of defining moments, things that shape their world. What did work mean to this generation? And again, just feel free to shout them out or send them in the chat box. This generation experienced Vietnam. What are some other things that this particular generation experienced? And feel free to use your smartphones. What were some of the big defining moments? And it's important to understand this because embracing how and why different generations show up in the workplace has such an impact on your ability to demonstrate inclusion. Home computers, thank you, Kathy. This generation experienced home computers. What did work look and feel like for this generation? To work was to Harmony shares, wars, lots of political. Yes. So everything to, to live. 
Work was a part of the American dream of working to take care of your family, purchase a house with a picket fence, have two and a half kids. Work was providing. And there were a lot of defining moments. So for example, as Alan shared, landing on the moon, the assassinations of John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King Jr. So think about how the perception of work has changed. We are literally in the midst of a great resignation, a labor shortage, because people have had over the past two years an opportunity to evaluate what's important to them, what matters to them. Now, next, Generation X. This generation was born between 1965 and 1976. The ages range between 44 and 45. Now for this generation, racial and ethnic diversity in the workplace is starting to increase. So for every three white people, one of those people are people of color. This generation also, in terms of communication mechanisms, preferred to email. Why do you think that is? Why do you think this generation was so big on emailing? It's faster, it's more efficient. It's also a what? It's a receipt. This generation is very, very big on hoarding emails. And I use that word intentionally. Exactly, Harmony shares Gen Xers like to get things done and keep the records of what they are told and what to do. There are Gen Xers that will have emails from 1996 because it's a part of the CYA mindset, which was part of the conditioning. CYA mean cover your, you know what? Now next, we have the millennials. The millennials born between 1977 and 1995, ages range between 25 and 43. Now this generation is starting to experience more racial and ethnic diversity. So for every two and a half people, one of those people, so about 40% are of color. This communication, this generation's preferred communication mechanism is what? We all know this, text, absolutely. If I call either one of my children, my son or my daughter, I'm going straight to voicemail and the voicemail is gonna say, this voicemail has not been set up. If I need to contact my children, and again, they're 24 and 27, you best believe I'm texting. Now, if they need something from me, what mechanism do they use in terms of communicating to get to me? Exactly, they call me. They call me because I come from a generation of, hello, how are you? What can I do for you? Versus texting. But keep in mind, if I need something from them, I know that I need to text. My son and I had um, a, a courageous moment about seven years ago. His sister had left the nest, went off to college, and it was me and him in the house. And I'm upstairs working. He's downstairs in the family room. And I receive a text message. Guess who it's from? Guess who I received the text message from? my son. Yes. And I thought, did he step away or is he, did he leave the house? No, he's downstairs. What do you think the text said? What do you think the text said? Exactly. Kathy and Alan, you're on it. What's for dinner? And do you know what my response was? Because I was so frustrated initially that he had the audacity to text me and I'm upstairs. This was what my response was. <laughs> I just said it in the chat. 
I fed him. I fed him. But what I had to do was realize that each generation has been conditioned to socialize differently. And it's not to say that I'm not a texter. It's not to say that I'm not an emailer, but understanding how each generation prefers to communicate and embracing that and knowing in different situations when to apply their preferred mechanism or when to apply yours is important. And again, it's not to say that just because I prefer to text that I won't do anything else, but it's the understanding and the awareness that it's not about, hey, this person communicates different from me, so they're wrong, I'm right. It's about understanding what each generation brings, including communication mechanisms. So what are your thoughts or questions so far on the previous slides? Millennials, Gen Xers, and baby boomers. Each of these generations brings something to the table. Alan shares, my wife will call my father-in-law and he texts back to call me. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love it. So versus looking at the problems based on differences. How about we transform our mindset and really embrace the possibilities? What can each of these generations bring to the table? Think about that. Now, I want us to keep in mind that each of the generations listed on the screen, so we have traditionalists, baby boomers, Gen X, millennials, and Gen Zers. And many people are already asking, well, what comes after Gen Z? That's to be determined. But what we can do as part of the Dream Bank community is really become more in tune with what each of the generations bring to the table. And that starts with understanding what each of these generations defining moments are, work ethic style, what's shaping their world, as well as pop icons and influencers. So just really quick, let's, let's start with the boomers. What were some defining moments that the baby boomers experienced? Defining moments. I think someone earlier had said Vietnam. Rock and roll, thank you, Kathy. Woodstock, absolutely. What else? Thank you, Nick. Good to see you. What else? Defining moments for the baby boomers. Growing up on a farm. Jeans. Now, now let's go to the Gen X generation, which again, between 1966 and 1976. What did the... Gen Xers experience? What were some of the defining moments? Now, let me say this, latchkey kids. Yes, grunge. I love it. Let me say this, regardless of how you identify in terms of generation, whether you identify as a Gen Xer, Gen Zer, millennial, however you identify, I want you to understand this. Each generation is the product of the preceding generation. And oftentimes when I coach companies or organizations regarding cross-generational communication, I always remind ourselves that in the spirit of inclusion, you cannot expect yourself from other generations, i.e., I cannot say those millennials. Those millennials are entitled. Those millennials are lazy. That's not right. It's toxic. And I also have to remind myself that my children are the product of how I raise them. As a single mother, I would, I would make choices. Some days I had to choose work and some other days I had to choose supporting their extracurricular activities. 
one of the things I noticed is that supporting work, I would feel this emotion that a lot of single parents experience when making decisions between work and family. What's that emotion? It starts with the letter G. Guilt. Thank you, Kathy. Guilt. And so what did I do to appease or alleviate my guilt when I couldn't make my son's basketball game or when I couldn't make my daughter's recital? What would I do? Just take a guess. Gifts. Yes, Harmony. I would purchase something for my kids and they did absolutely nothing or I didn't even have a clue. I would just say, hey, sorry, I missed your game here, a pair of Jordans. Okay, thanks. Proceeding generations cannot punish the subsequent generation because oftentimes they are a result of how they were conditioned and what they experienced. So if my kids were accustomed to receiving gifts without putting much effort, why would they not expect acknowledgement or a trophy or accolades? And again, this is not to imply that all millennials expect trophies. This is to make sure that each of us understand that the generational behaviors, mindsets, and work style that's exhibited is oftentimes based on how the preceding generation poured into them and what they witnessed. Why would I feel obligated to be loyal to my employer year after year after year when I witnessed my parents being laid off? Why would I wanna wait 10 years to get a promotion when I saw the impact that that had on my parents or my guardians? So again, I ask each of you to be very aware of the defining moments, the work ethic style, even the negative stereotypes that each of these generations manage. And really think about why and how they are who they are. Does that make sense? Because each generation has had their own experience of what shaped their world. So for example, 9-11, it impacted many generations. But when you think about the generation that was impacted the most, oftentimes you think of millennials or Gen Zers, or excuse me, millennials or Gen Xers. You know, for me as a Gen Xer, and I know someone had brought this up earlier in the chat, the challenger the spaceship that crashed the Challenger, that was the biggest deal. That happened when I was in the fourth grade and I will never forget that day. You know, for, for Gen Zers and millennials, having a black president or a black female president, it's not really a big deal. For older generations, that is huge. So we have to also consider how each of the generations were conditioned, what they experienced. What were the people that influenced each of these generations? So for my generation, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Billy Idol, MTV, Prince. Today's generation, Beyonce, Kim Kardashian, yes. Gaga, I love Lady Gaga, but, but definitely everyone embrace in addition to understanding what makes each of these generations and how and why they show up the way that they do, because it is not a one size fits all. And what may be perceived from your lens as something extracurricular could be the primary way that the other generation was conditioned to engage with others, i.e. social media. So here are some examples of some innovative cross-generational solutions that I wanna share with you uh, to consider as part of engaging. Now, the traditionalists 
is not tech savvy. This generation is not tech savvy and prefers direct interaction. So this is where different generations can allow this generation to facilitate the team follow-ups. Work more with entry-level team members on what measurable work looks like. Because remember, this generation has seen a lot. They have a breadth of knowledge. That's something that we can leverage from this generation. The Gen Xer, or excuse me, let me go in order. The baby boomer is also not necessarily that tech tech savvy and also prefers direct interaction. This is where you can allow this generation to serve as a liaison between senior employees and entry-level employees because they've experienced both. Do you see how this is all about finding things that you can leverage versus focusing on this generation is so different, this is gonna be problematic. I want us to begin to think about ways that we can leverage what each of these generations bring. The Gen Xer, now this generation is starting to become more tech savvy. This is where the Commodore 64 became a household item. Remember Commodore 64? Remember floppy disks? Remember the first iMac? Yes, these are all things that started to become at the forefront of how Gen Xers worked. Gen Xers are great multitaskers, tech savvy. So this is where you can allow them to set up inner office communications and training. And this generation also is more motivated by cash incentives or monetary awards versus trophies. <laughs> and she says, don't make me break out the Nintendo 64. I love it. Now, the millennials, this generation, extremely tech savvy. Great sense of humor. If you look at all the memes that we see that bring us laughter and entertainment. And millennials think outside the box. Millennials can simplify a process that traditionally took three or four hours and condense that into three or four minutes. Anytime that I need something simplified, I text my daughter and I text my son. And I'm like, hey, this is how I'm struggling. I was doing this. And they're like, oh, mom, just do this. Boom. Thank you for the gift of time. And I share this with each of you, because I want you to think about the last time that someone made you feel insignificant or less than or disconnected because of the generation that you identify as. And then I want you to think about in the spirit of inclusion, how we can really leverage what each of these generations bring versus creating division. Because again, each generation bring something that you can leverage. So I want you to think about, and write, if you have something as Andy had asked before, something to write with and write on, feel free to use your tablet or your laptop or your desktop. But I want you at least to write down or list at least three techniques that you will start to use. Like you're gonna start using or being more intentional with using these techniques to communicate with different generations in the workplace. So if you say, hey, I work with a number of Gen Xers or I work with a number of baby boomers, I'm gonna start using more of this communication mechanism than I have before. And I also want you to hold yourself accountable by identifying specifically who you're going to be more intentional about meeting them where they are and when you're gonna do it. So how, who, and when? And I'll give you a few moments to write that down or to document it. This is where we get into the accountability.
Anyone want to share? What are some of the techniques that you identify that you can use more as part of working with different generations in the workspace? Just give me some examples, either unmute your audio or send it in the chat. What's, what thoughts do you have? What techniques can we use to communicate with different generations? Well, let me give you some quick suggestions before we, we wrap up. Oh, wonderful. Courtesy, patience, covering different communication styles verbal. I'll follow up with an email or a chat. I'll say, let's follow up to discuss as needed. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. Latanya shares Teams mirror text. Love it. And keep in mind, there are primarily five different ways, five different ways that we communicate in the workplace. Let me see if y'all can give them to me. What's one way that we communicate primarily in the workplace? Email. Yes. What else? Instant message verbally. Yes. Body language, email, text. How about this one? There are some people who still communicate via this way. And I'm going to put this in the chat. We cannot forget about those that come from the generation of handwritten messages, handwritten notes. And sometimes this is not even just generational. So think about that. <laughs> Harmony shares, I've been remote so long that I forgot about that one. Nick shares facts. Nick, I triple dog dare you to tell me the last time you sent someone a fax. <laughs> I triple well, dog I, dare I, you. I had, to, uh, I had to take advantage of the wonderful vacation opportunities that keep showing up on the fax machine. Anybody else see that? <laughs> Harmony said that she sent a fax last week. I cannot even remember the last time I've sent a fax, but I love it. And see, this is important. It's important to understand that there are so many communication mechanisms that people from different generations or just quite frankly, individuals use based on their preferred communication mechanism. So embrace it, understand it and embrace it. And there's so many different ways that we can communicate. Now, what's, what's the value proposition? What's in this for each of you? Any time that you embrace someone's difference in order to motivate high performance, it creates less turnovers. You know, we're in the midst of the great resignation right now, huge labor shortage. So we wanna do everything that we can to bring out the best in ourselves as well as others that we work with. We wanna be able to engage with one another. We wanna drive engagement. And it's much easier to not only recruit but retain great fits when you're meeting people where they are and you have that understanding of how each generation was conditioned, how each generation was conditioned to primarily communicate. We wanna make sure that every generation is represented in our Dream Bank community, in life in general. We wanna be able to bring out our best authentic self. So again, my preferred communication mechanism, I'm gonna see if anybody can guess. What do you think my preferred communication mechanism is? Let's see. Nope, not email. Yes, thank you, Ashley. I'm a face-to-face -face person. If I cannot meet with you face-to-face, -face, then I will definitely leverage FaceTime, Zoom. I want to hear and see you. My least preferred communication mechanism is email. And even though I'm a Gen Xer, it's, it's, it's another thing I have to do. I would much rather pick up the phone or meet you in person. It's not to say that I won't email, but it's not my preferred. And so I also want to challenge each of you to think about who needs to know your preferred communication mechanism. and. Does everyone that depends on you know what your preferred communication mechanism is? 
It's very important to understand that. Angie shares as a Gen X minus text, don't call me. I love it. People need to understand how to get the best out of you, including communication. So based on today's session, I want you to consider and share in the chat box something that you're leaving here with today, even if it's just an aha moment, something that you already knew, but it needed to be reiterated that you're going to share with others. So just send that in the chat box. Harmony says, when I was a coach, I let my team know right up front, don't call me, email me or text me because I struggle with retaining verbal stuff. And sometimes, and then I would follow up based on what their best communication style was, is I love that. Thank you so much for sharing Harmony. Sandy shares, we are all seeking the same goals, ambitions. Let's work together. Love it, love it, love it. Kathy shares how the shift is towards a younger workforce, how great the shift is towards a younger workforce. Thank you, Kathy. Ashley shares, there is value in everyone. Our differences make us great. I love it could not have finished on a better note. So again, I challenge, and thank you, LaTanya, embrace those innovative solutions. Embrace the fact that every generation brings something that we can leverage to the table. Collaboration is so necessary because every day we are reminded that we're different. But versus looking that as problematic, understand it and embrace it and let people know what brings out the best in you and seek what brings out the best in others, even from a cross-generational standpoint. Any questions or thoughts before we adjourn? Questions, perspectives. Thank you, Harmony. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I always enjoy collaborating with great humans that are engaging. I love it. Food is a great cohesive, and I'm hungry too. <laughs> Listen, thank y'all so much. I appreciate you making the time to be here. I appreciate your intention, your engagement. I absolutely love each of you. Please continue to stay in contact with me. If you have any feed forward in terms of what I did well or what I didn't do well, I'm a work in progress. I don't pretend to be perfect. Um, so again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate your engagement. I'm actually trying to disconnect as a millennial. The phone was such a big part of my life. I'm getting sick of it. I totally hear you, Alan. So Andy, I'm going to pass the mic back to you. And again, thank y'all so much. Have a great rest of the day. Have a great rest of the week and happy pride. Thank you so much for that, Denise. Much appreciated. I want to thank everyone uh, who was able to tune in today as well, too. Uh, to check out this event. I'm going to go ahead and put a link in the chat. It's to our YouTube page. That's a great resource for where you can not only find this event's recording uh, about a week after uh, it, it is aired today, but also all of our other events that we've had uh, since about the end of March of, of 2020. Um, so yeah, so with that being said, we will go ahead and cap it there and we will see you all next time. Take care.